me, I can't quite see it. Uh, just a sec. Okay, can you see right, it there now? There we go, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, uh, okay, so this is the test that I created for uh, this notebook, uh, Compare Model Performance. And uh, this is actually a different kind of test. Uh, I mean, different from the one that I created before. Mm -hmm. And I'm using this TB patch. Uh, to uh, you know, mock this function, this cache it download, and uh, here I uh, call the mock function, and here I also use their assert uh, called with function to check if uh, it was correctly mocked, and uh, this doesn't give any warnings or anything. It doesn't blow up here. So I'm but looking. I'm looking I, at what I'm seeing right now is your Chrome window. Is that what you want me to be seeing? I'm sorry. I'm I'm seeing your Chrome window. That's the Juniper notebook. Are you trying to show me that, or are you trying to show me something else? Oh, I was trying to show you my uh, uh, my local. Let me share it again. Sorry. No worries. No worries. I thought that might be going on. So. Hey, Sudhanshu, how's it going? Yep, it's going great. How is it going with you? That's going well. All right, can you okay, see? Okay, yeah, now? now we can see. Yeah. All right, so uh, this is the test that I created. Okay. Uh, Perfect. For um, compare model performance notebook, and here I am uh, using the patch function for cache it download. Uh, as mock download, okay. And here I call here, here I call it as well, and then I use their assert called with function to cross check if uh, you know uh, is throwing in the right values, the right parameters. Yeah. And it doesn't go up here, but then uh, when I uh, ex um yeah when I uh, print the output of the notebook and uh, uh, it's just not right. Like it's using actually using the function uh, that's present in the notebook. And when I check uh, my directories, uh, I do also have uh, this file in the wrong folder. Okay. Um, so, have you tried doing instead of main cache download, doing the DFML util net? Uh, I'm sorry. Have you tried doing dfml.util.net instead of underscore underscore main? No, I haven't. Okay, let's try that. dfml.net? Uh, I think it's util.net. Oh. Is that it? Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's still uh, DFFMO slash okay. wine quality. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, but if we do it the other way, uh, like uh, before when yeah. we were uh, in uh, executing the specific cells that yeah. fine. You know, what, what, how about what if we were to do something else where we just basically create a temporary directory for each test? Um, and so, so when you do that at test book and execute equals true, does that mean before test cache download is called, the, the book has already been executed? 
Um, uh, yeah, yeah, the whole book has been executed. All right. So, because I'm just thinking, you know, uh, it might be yeah. it might be good to, um, it might be good to just you know change directory to a temporary directory then execute the notebook then we wouldn't have to worry about all this you know because then we wouldn't have to go and change calls to things and stuff you know we'd just you know all of this would exist within a temporary directory and any files it creates would just be deleted afterwards right uh, can you can you can you repeat that uh, like what are we changing so if we were to execute the test book within a um, yeah. temporary directory, then uh, we yeah. wouldn't have to worry about mocking the calls to cache download to delete various things. We, uh, we okay. could just, we, you know, we would just do like with uh, temp file dot temporary directory, and then, you know, ch -dir to the temporary directory, and then, um, you know, run the test book. And then, you know, it would, if the, if the paths are all, you know, just top level paths like wine quality, then it would end up just being, you know, uh, it would, it would, yeah, it would but, be. Uh, wouldn't it still be downloading it in the same path as the one uh, given in the original notebook? Well, so what's so what's the path given in the original notebook? Then I guess. Um, can we look at that real quick? So wine quality. Like, dot yeah so we have wine quality csv and so yeah if you were to um yeah so it so would just be if, within uh, the, it, i mean I a temporary directory. Uh -huh. yeah. sorry you know go for it uh so you mean if uh we are creating a temporary direct directory and running the test it will actually be running the whole notebook inside the temporary directory and would also save the wine quality in that temporary directory. Yep. And then it'll, will, it will, you know, the, with the width, width statement, it'll just remove the temporary directory when we're done. And that way we don't have to deal with, you know, any of the mocks yeah. or anything. Right. All right. That's probably going to be our easiest thing. I can't. I wonder why we didn't think about that before, <laughs> because that's what we're doing with every other test case. Yeah. So probably because of that yeah. test book decorator, that's probably why it makes it a little more confusing. So is there a way to just call that, but not as a decorator? Um, um, uh, you can use it as a context manager, I think. Okay. I'm not sure about that, but uh, that's about it. Yeah, decorator and context yeah. manager pattern. Let's see, with test book. Okay, yeah, that's perfect. So we could just say with, uh, okay, so we could basically say, you know, with temp file dot temporary directory as, you know, tempter, and then we could say, I think there's a dfml.util.os, dot os, and then there's a chdir, and so then we could say with dfml.util.os dot chdir, and then pass it tempter, and then you could say with test book, and then full pass to the test book, um, and then um, or to the notebook, and then and then you know whatever is in the body there. So basically, you'd have three with statements. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. All right, sweet. Um, so yeah, we'll do with tempter, with chdir, with testbook. And then at that point, you know, it should have run, right? And so if it, it threw any errors, then it would already have exploded, right? Right. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So yeah, let's do that. Let's change it to be that. And then... Um, and then I think, you know, we're pretty much good on that at that point, right? Is there anything else that we need there? Because at that point, um, it will execute the, the book, right? And if, if any of the code threw any exceptions, then the, the test case would fail, right? Yeah, uh, I'm still a bit uh, confused about the, uh, the automation of the test, like... Um... Oh, yeah. So... Um, so the automation of the test, so basically, so if you write, um, you know, let's just go change that test case to do this and then we can sort of do the automation here. It won't take too long. Right now? 
Yeah, right now. Because um, basically what you have, so take that test book, execute, you know, move it into the body of the test cache download. Um, I'm sorry. Um, here, let's see. Um, I wonder. All right, so test book. So, okay, let me see. Wonder what's a better way for explaining this. So, um, so remember how we talked about test slash test doc strings? All right, yeah, so you yeah. have it open there. Um, so basically, the same same yeah. sort of thing, I think. Um, so what we can do is we can basically create. You know, you could have your test notebook and scroll all the way to the bottom. Yeah. So you can have your 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 test notebook class, and then uh, skip over this part. This is where we're loading all sorts of objects from DFML. So, so basically, what we're going to need to do this is the part that's of interest to us. So this is where we create a new test case class, um, and uh, and so um, so basically, you can see like that test doc string and test console test. That's where we're where we're creating functions so that MK test case and MK console test those just create um, you know those those are functions which return a function and that function is the test case um, right. for that object. So what we can do is we can do the same thing where we'll create a function that returns a function, right? And that function it returns will run the test case on a specific notebook, right? So really, um, you know, our you know our our make IPython notebook test um, function will accept the path to a IPython notebook, and then it will you know just return a function that does the with tempter with chter with execute, and it'll pass to execute the path that it was given you know, to make the test case out of. Um, and then we can, you know, set that as a property on your on your test notebooks class, right? And so we can basically do like a for loop over, you know, we can use the pathlib library to do a for loop. For loop. Um, you can use that rglob function. So you can do pathlib.path, path, and yeah. then you get the path to the test, or, you know, you get the path to the root of the dffml repo. And I think that's there's an example of that in here as well, right. or there's some somewhere. It's there's usually root dir in all caps with an underscore. But um, so you get the path to the root of the DFML directory. You do recursive search for anything with the IPython notebook extension, and then you go through and you call your make test case function, um, you know, on on anything with a with that's an IPython notebook, right? And then you basically just do you know right. you assign it using. You know, you can assign it using set after to. In this case, we've actually created a test case class where there's two functions, but we could just have one class, right? That test notebook class, and you can just do a for loop over every Python notebook um, using our glob, and then you just do, you know, you mk, you create, you use your make IPython notebook test case function to create a new function that's going to be the test case, and then you can use set after to say, you know, set after uh, no test notebooks, um, and so so add this function to te test notebooks, and then you know make the function called you know this method name right, and the method name could be uh, similarly to what we did here was we basically took like the um, path to the object that we're testing here, and we sort of you know we made it underscored um, instead of slashes, right? So, for example, if you're testing like the CLI version command, I think it ends up being like you know the the name. In this case, it ends up being the class name, but in your case, it would be the method method name. So, uh, if you had right. like the current notebook that you're testing that's under examples, so if it was examples and then X notebook or x.ipython notebook, then you would have, you know, the, the method name you would create or use for set after would be test underscore examples underscore x, right? All right. So that, does that all make sense and sound good? Yeah, yeah, it does. Cool. Yeah, yeah. and that way you know every time... Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so that and that way, every time you add a new file, it's basically just going to run that same you know sequence of with blocks, and and it'll end up running the whole notebook, right? So sweet. All right, uh, just one more thing. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, like uh, we're running uh, the whole uh, the tests on the whole output now, right? So mm -hmm. what about uh, like it would vary and some uh, uh, like some models also throw out uh, some you know uh, different kinds of outputs. So uh, like how do we uh, want it to be uh, like generic? What do you mean tests on the output? Mm, like here. Uh, so does it do a direct a comparison? Showing the stand up output, yeah. Yeah, so it does, does Testbook do a direct comparison to make sure that's the same content that was output? Yeah, it, it gives you uh, the same output as the notebook. OK. Um, and so you're saying, like, if the output changes, then, um, then uh, the test book will will fail because it's not the exact same output. Is that what you're saying? Um, I'm, uh, like I'm not sure like uh, those... to what degree do we want? Yeah. Like if the accuracy, you're, are you saying that that test book will get mad if that accuracy four is you know zero point one three two one instead of zero point one three two zero, or are you saying that should we check whether the output is the same? Yeah, I'm saying should we check uh, that the output is the same? Like, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, if you say that uh, we would have a generic test that would be running for all the notebooks and uh, different notebooks would have different cells and yeah uh, so that. like yeah it might run so the the concern here is yes it might run but like did it actually you know make any sense at all right is that yeah. that's that's a concern okay. yeah um so i don't know i think that that a rudimentary way to do this is to just throw assert statements into these blocks right you could say, you know, assert actually yeah. is greater than, you know, 0.1 um, at the end here. Uh, like, uh, like these, just a sec, uh, created some over here. Um, yeah, that type of stuff. Yeah, that, yeah. that, yeah, if you did something like that, you know, yeah, inject that. Yeah, you could put that just in the notebook even um, because... Yeah. That way, it just stays with the notebook. The, the you know the thing is like how do you how do you add enough so that it's not confusing to the end users who need to get the point right, but is still like minimal enough to to test for something right. Um, and and if you think that you can't do it effectively within the notebook, and you know to satisfy both those constraints, then let's think about doing more stuff right. But if you just need to, you know, if you could just maybe do an assertion on one of those accuracies, and it's probably enough to be sufficient, right? Then you know maybe yeah. you just say you know at the very end of that block you had assert accuracy four is greater than point one, right? And if it fell below point one, you would know, hey, all right, okay, now there's probably something wrong with the rest of these, right? Um, I don't yeah. know. Uh, you know, you could do it for everyone, you could do it for some, but yeah, you're right. The balance here is, you know, how do we make sure that that it doesn't, you know, the the checks don't end up confusing the user, um, and but. Right, because or else you need to add some sort of extra infrastructure. To say, okay, how do we how do we do some extra validation on top of all of this? All right, and and that's right. you know, and that's that's up to you. That's your judgment call, right? Like, what do you think? Uh, what's the balance there? And if there, you know, if if there needs to be some kind of different balance, then um, you know, that's where that's where you know that generic test case thing. Um, you know, it might end up becoming, okay, so you do that for loop and you do all those set outers, right? But if you found for some reason that one specific test case needed to be uh, different, you could just write a function, right? And say, you know, test notebook blank equals my new test function. And then the body would be whatever you wanted, right? So you could easily override, um, you know, what, what, what the automatically generated test case would have been, right? And then do more injections or more whatever for that specific notebook, right? All right, all right. Uh, um, I also want to ask you, uh, like, uh, the 
two or three notebooks in the start are like basic use cases, right? And most of the code is uh, repeating in all those notebooks. Uh-huh. So uh, would we want to squash these notebooks into one or uh, do we want to keep them separate? I don't know. I mean, I think... I think that's also like, would do you think just because they have the same starting content, I don't know if that means that they should be put into the same notebook because part of this is we're trying to, you know, do one concept at a time, right? Um, yeah. If we hit everybody, if we hit people with many concepts at the same time, like it could be good for them to see the initial setup multiple times, right? Um, yeah. You know? Yeah. I was thinking uh, like, uh, uh, Mm, maybe we have uh, more of a generic name rather than compare model performance and moving between models. And uh, then we have, uh, like, because uh, these headings also uh, show up in the documentation, right? Yeah. So uh, if even if we uh, squash them, uh, we would still uh, be able to show it on our uh, documentation uh, in sections. Yeah. I don't know uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, and and yeah, so so I think keeping them separate, right? Um, so because if you say because you also yeah, right? Like at the end of the day, what does it look like right now? Because I was just looking at it. Um, so so right now we have examples. Uh, no, I'm just looking at the documentation under the master branch. So we have examples, notebooks, and then moving between models, import packages, and and it shows two levels deep here. So, or, so it says on the notebooks page, it says moving between models, import packages, build a data set. So you're saying, you know, we may have some repeated subheaders, but, you know, either we could get more, we might need like a more descriptive title on the document or something, um, or... Is that, is that what you're saying? Like maybe change the titles a little bit so they're a little more descriptive so that people know? Um, uh, no, I was saying if we were to squash it, we could uh, have the main title as more generic mm. uh, and uh, have multiple use cases in the same notebook uh, mm-hmm. under different subheadings. Mm. Like uh, one heading could be moving between models mm-hmm. after you know we have uh, uh, downloaded that the data set. Yeah. Uh, we show how to move it. If, and if, after that, we could show how to see the performance. See, that's see, yeah. I think I think that's a good idea, especially if it's the same data set being used. Then, yeah, combining the yeah, notebooks yeah. probably makes sense. Um, and I think actually this is the one downfall of that temporary directory is um, is the fact that you're going to end up with. Um, so the downfall of the temporary directory is that you don't get the cache download stuff. But now what I'm realizing is instead of doing a temporary directory, we could just create a directory if it doesn't exist already under test downloads and then CD into that de- that directory, which is already in the git ignore. And that way we, we maintain that we maintain a cache, but we're still within a git ignored place. Does that make sense? Yeah. All so, right. so, so, so same concept, right? But instead of doing temporary directory, let's actually just, you know, put it under test downloads. Um, you know, uh, and actually, yeah, we can just put yeah, it but, in Yeah, but uh, weren't, weren't we also uh, already doing that? Like that was the issue, no? Well, I think the issue uh, now right was here? that the tests get run from the very top level directory, right? So what we can do is let's see did you you because you added that test slash notebooks to the git ignore right yeah i added this one to the git ignore yeah to test notebooks data so so what we can do is we can now just instead of you know how we were going to create the temporary directory we can say you know create test notebooks data if it doesn't exist, right, as the setup for each test, right, we were talking about, you know, first do with tempter, then do with chdir, then do with test book, right? And that's probably your okay. generic test case, right? So now instead of doing with tempter, basically say, you know, if test notebooks data does not exist, create test notebooks data, and then chdir to test notebooks data, right? And that way we eliminate the usage of the tempter. And now we, so, so we now, every test book is executed within test notebooks data, which means that when we do the cache downloads call calls, um, if we had already downloaded it, then it stays downloaded. And that way we speed up our test execution if we're running it locally. 
All right. All right. All right, sweet. All right. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I'll. Uh, I think I have pretty much uh, completed this notebook. I'll push it, and later you can re review great. it offline. That sounds great. I have some other things to discuss as well, but I don't right. have taken enough time. Uh, will we schedule a one one on one? Yeah. So so let's try to do a one on one. So this week is probably not going to work for me. I got a pretty tight week here, so it'll probably be next week. Is there anything that you need to that you need to talk about? Um, um, you know that you want to talk about. Um, that's time more time sensitive related to the project, you know. I think you seem uh, like you have a good path here, but do you have anything else? Week. What? Oh, yeah, finals. I have something for the next week. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I mean uh, the scheduled uh, notebook for the next week. I mm -hmm. have to discuss that. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, here let's let's uh, do some stuff from Sudhanshu, and then let's come back to that. Um, that way we can split some. Time. Sure. Sure. Great. Um, so let's, and let me just write in the notes here. So generic test cases for notebooks. Um, let me show my screen. So let's um, do the test. Let's test. And uh, loop over all time. Notebook files and the repo root now using glob path loop path glob um, use set atter test notebooks um, Um, okay, um, and then my test book test case will be function that um, returns uh, test cases this function um, which uh, creates test slash notebooks slash data if it doesn't exist default.util.os.ch into it uh, then does with test book. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Um, so Sudhanshu, what do, what do we got going on today? I've been taking a look at your phase eight stuff, but I haven't gotten a chance to do the next stage of my review here. Yep. So I was actually waiting for the phase eight to be merged. Cool. And and along the side, I'm also working on the accuracy scorer model. Okay, cool. Yeah, Sweet. So that work is still going. Sweet. Um, and then did you see, so let's see, load to, oh no, this is that stupid bug. I hate this bug. Oh my God. I hate this bug. This is the bug. You guys have seen this before. This is the one where it, the unit test library tries to, it looks at functions and it decides it should instantiate the function as if it were a test case class. I don't understand why it does this. It's extremely annoying. Ah. Okay. God damn, I hate this bug. I don't understand why it does this. Um. Oh well. All right. Okay. We'll figure this out. Um. 
Is there anything, let's see, so, what is this mad about? I'm feeling, let's see what this is mad about. So what, so what did you want to, do you want to talk about anything today or did you just want to give an update? Uh, I just wanted to give an update. Okay, okay, great. And, yep. Yeah. And probably get the phase eight much. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Yeah, since the CI is not passing, we'll probably need to make sure that it passes, obviously, um, before we can merge it. Um, so we'll see how see we'll see what's up with this because um, there's probably I mean it looks like most things are probably good, um, but you know here and there. Um, Okay, we'll have to figure this stuff out. I don't think it should be too complicated, hopefully. Um, I mean, knock on wood. Famous last words, okay. Um, all right, okay, great. So let's let's then, Hashim, let's go back to you and see. So what, what else did we have for you? All right, so uh, in one of the previous meetings, we talked about how models uh, you can't... Uh, actually change the hyperparameters. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, really affects uh, the second wave of my project, that is tuning models. Uh, All right. So I'm not sure what I should show there. OK, <laughs> because, yeah. Uh, I have no, to do it's... it with the Python API, right? You have to do it with what? Uh, because uh, I'm using Python API and the notebooks, right? Mm, yeah. Um, let's see. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where was that? Because we had a long discussion on that. Um, yeah. Okay, config properties, immutable or immutable. Um, I think the next real step on this is is we need to review this document, don't we? Because I think we were going to look at this some more. Um, I don't think anybody commented on this. Um, let's see. So this was the stuff that we came up with. Um, the immutable versus immutable. I think that the main thing was that we need to go and let's see. So what did we say to do default values? Okay, this has to do with saving and loading. So this is not as uh, pertinent to your stuff, but more to see to see heal. So, um, Um, let's see. So this was more pertinent to your stuff, right? So did we have any to do's in here to do? Maybe I meant to write it to do. Um, let's see. This is all the below stuff that actually get copied into the other file. Um, I think maybe, you know, what you need to do is you need to go implement this first, this mutable tag. Um, so I think this might be necessary to do first here. Um, essentially, you know, and what we talked about is is that's really so the the field function will need to be modified to add the mutable keyword argument. And I think this stuff here just is this was uh, I'm not sure if this is finished yet here. I can't remember. I need to see the to do. So this stuff may not may or not be a part of this. Um, I think this might have had to do with this model saving and loading and got copied down. Yeah, it looks like it just stayed because this is a copy of the same file that got edited to be two different files, right? Because we started writing one and then we realized there's actually two things that were involved, you know, mutable versus immutable and then um, then also saving and loading and what should take precedence. So I split them into two ADRs. Um, so I think what you need to do is go add this this mutable keyword to the field property, and then also, um, it, I think if you add the mutable keyword to the field property, and then you do this mutable callback thing, um, and and essentially, well, you know what that will be would, would be basically like make it so that the config structure 
<laughs> let's see different oh, base so this mutable callback thing so essentially what we'll want to do here is this so config add config right we'll want to have like a add what is this add mutable callback So, and then we'll want to say submutable callbacks is set um, so I mean, oh, right, that's right. This gets a little bit deeper, doesn't it? Um, Because we were going to have to do config getters, like getters and setters on all of these things. So basically, like, are we even using the data class stuff still? Oh, God. Um, okay. Um, yeah, it wasn't a small thing. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a small thing, was it? Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Yeah, the thing is, your tutorial will either be end up being like very specific to the scikit models which is not good you know we shouldn't the whole point is that nothing should be specific to one library um or we have to do this um so i wonder it's our data classes that data class um I wonder if we end up throwing out this whole data class thing. Um, that probably causes problems. I bet a lot of things assume that config objects are data classes. Uh, we can check. Yo, God, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Not terribly much, okay. Uh, right, data class. Okay, so we do have a lot of data class specific usage in here. Because the question becomes like, okay, um, oh yeah, the thing was like, if we need to be able to control the immutability of various properties rather than just the entire object by itself, then we can no longer, you know, we can't really leverage the data class infrastructure anymore. Um, we have to create our own thing that's very much like a data class, but it's not. Um, hmm. So, um, uh, that's annoying. Um, let's see. It's definitely good to do though. Definitely important. So, so if we change config properties, we want to be able to change things in models um, in a way that's transparent to the underlying library. Um, and that's our main thing here, because we need to be able to turn hyperparameters and hyperparameters are config properties really. Um, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see here. I'm trying to decide whether there's a way around the data class um, ditching of the data class library or not. Because um, if we can just maybe keep, because there's just some stuff that data classes defines that is nice. So I think what we want is to make sure that we aren't, so we aren't using frozen right now. So I don't think that's an issue. Um, frozen parameter. Where is it? Frozenness. Not frozen the hash. No hash. Frozen parameter. Oops, oh, geez, sorry. Um, 
Let's see, frozen instance error, frozen, 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 frozen. Wait a minute, data class params. Now this has to do with the class itself, field sign. If we are a frozen class, frozen, frozen, field sign, frozen. I'm wondering if there's a way to declare a field as frozen. Because that would be something. Looks like there's not a way to go there. If a field, if we could freeze a single field, you now see that won't really help us because we have to have this getter and setter type thing. So the question becomes like, can we do that and maintain data classness stuff? Um, okay, so what happens if we try? Let's just give this a try real quick here. Um, All right, where are we here? Um, are you serious? Nope. Oh, we're not in. All right, okay, let's give this a try. So, okay, uh, so let's create a config class. Oh, what was our example here? So let's just do this example. All right, we'll just we'll just do the same example and see if it works. Okay, so field got unexpected keyword immutable. All right, um. All right so we have this mutableness. So now we have this mutable keyword and add callback mutable or wait add mutable callback function object has no attribute add mutable callback. Function object self so config that add mutable. Self config so config is for some reason a function. Oh, we never called it it. Let's just do this. Okay. So, data class is not defined. Okay. All right. Okay. So here we go. Here's our base, our baseline. So now what we really need to do is we need to go through and we need to like iterate over all of these uh, fields. Um, we need to say data class data. data classes dot fields so we need to be able to like look at the 
look at the fields here and like make them properties somehow. And if they like, can we do this is the question, right? So we have this data class, we created it. Uh, so now we need to be able to like data class set at her data class and then field dot name uh, property. And then what does property do? Okay, setter or get set delete. Okay. So git would be, um, well, to do, let's see. Okay. Um, where is the data for the data class stored? It's a really good question. Um, is it a dictionary? Is it just a property itself? I think it might just be a property of the class git field field. Man, we're deep in this. Um, I think, I think, I mean, the question is like, can we just override it? And then like, does this stupid value exist? Like, where does the stupid value exist, right? Because um, if the value, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter. We can just create the value somewhere else. It's like, does the, if we were to go, okay. So we create this an instance. So if data class is created and it creates an instance of class, right? Um, so, for example, remember user list, and I don't know if you guys remember the bug that we had with user list a while ago, or, or user dict. Um, so, if you look at collections, um, uh, collections user dict. So, here's an example of this. Um, basically, this is like you know what you would subclass from if you wanted a dictionary, and then it, like a custom dictionary type, and then in reality it has this sub this property that is the real dictionary. And so if you you know you know do a subtext into this like you know user dict, and then uh, bracket a in bracket it actually goes and looks for it in this data property. So it's it goes and looks in user dict the the object dot data dot you know brackets a. Um, so the question is, with data classes, you know, what is it doing? Um, you know, is it actually just directly setting these properties, or is is there some kind of uh, is there some kind of uh, uh, you know thing thing like a sub object like this where it's data? Um, because if there's some kind of sub object, then you know, then we just you know our proper our getter and setter need to need to pull from that and set to that. If there's no sub property, then we'll now, okay, now we need to make something like data, right? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I get that. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, uh, where's this stupid thing? I don't know. I think, you know, I think it'll work. Um, let's see, let's just, let's just try it. Let's, we're just gonna do it with a little, we're just gonna, you know, we're just going to say data class dot underscore uh, mutable. Okay, and actually, I think we, what do we have to do? I guess we have to go through everything, don't we? Because um, we want to make a property for everything, and, and by default, everything is immutable or immutable, right? So we really need to say uh, mutable and then immutable. Equals. So these are both just going to be like dictionaries. And then we'll just go through and we'll say if, you know, field dot metadata mutable. Right, just oh, and we can do maybe this. Or ooh, maybe this key value. Right, and we can say so setter controls dot 
хорошо. And then this needs to call self dot or for func in self dot mutable callbacks. Um, so we need to go through, we set the value, so self dot mutable um, key equals value and then func key value. And then there's no so set immutable is just raise exception, uh, you know, to do replace with. Okay. Um, okay. Um, So by default, it's set immutable, um, and you know we pass it the field name as the key, so we can do right. So we use func functools.partial here uh, because it basically creates a new. Uh, it, it wraps these functions and it makes the first argument to them. Um, it makes the first argument to them. Um, well, we need to pass the data class too, don't we? makes the first argument to them uh, field data class and field dot name. Um, so, and I don't know, let's see, I don't know what's going to happen if we do pro if we do property, what happens with property? Will it already pass? Will it already pass self because that'll be annoying. Okay, it does do self. Great. Thanks a lot. Not. Um, okay, whatever. Um, we'll just do this. I think this will work. I mean, I don't know. Do you guys want to see me finish this, or do you want to just try it, try the rest of this, Hashim? Yeah, I could try it. Uh, you don't have to finish it. All right. All right. So then, yeah, great. So I'll just do this, and then you know, key. So set mutable value. All right. And then I'll just send you this patch here. Um, sure, thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right. Um, great. I think that's pretty much. It's just like, and then you don't need functuals partial. This looks pretty right to me, um, but obviously, you know, who knows? So then you need the getter as well right um and you know you you honest actually you probably don't even need you can just use like data right um and that way you could have the getter be the same thing um yeah so then you need a getter a setter and what was the last one um a deleter. Um, so I guess you, you're you not going to have a deleter because you can't delete the config properties. Um, so to so do uh, make deleter function raise since we can't delete config properties. I don't know. I think so. I think that's what we want. But, you know, and then, yeah. So. Oh yeah. Okay. So. All right. All right. Sorry. Right. Okay. All right. Whatever. Um. Mutable. Metadata mutable. Field metadata mutable. All right, well, I'm not sure why that's that, but um, you get the picture, right? Um, just let me know if it, it yeah. yeah. 
Okay, let's just post this. Oh, and that's, you don't care about that one. Uh, that's stupid Python 3.9 stuff. Okay, so this, how am I going to get this to you? I'll just do it when my screen is in that, or I'll, I'll switch my screen resolution. I'll copy-paste it into Gitter, um, or I'll put it as a GIST. Actually, I can just do this. GH GIST, GIST create uh, file name. P file name uh, default or what is this? This is uh, immutable config default patch. I've been liking this uh, command line GitHub thing. It's pretty pretty sweet. All right, so great. All right, so this is hopefully a start on that. Um, We'll need to do mutable versus immutable config properties first. Okay. Uh, and then let me know how that goes, obviously. So. Sweet. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, hopefully that works out. Um, but you never know, right? Time to help. This could have probably taken me days. Hey, no problem, no problem. Um, uh, let's, yeah, don't, and don't, you know, if, if you start running into stuff, right, like, don't, don't spend too much time on it, like, ping me, and then, you know, maybe work on a, d a different, like, because you could probably write the notebook without having, you know, maybe don't test it, but just write sort of what you think is going to be the code, right? Um, because obviously we don't have, we're going to need to go and, and, and tweak Scikit a little bit and stuff, I think, for this. Um, so you can sort of write the notebook code and then come back to this. Um, because, yeah, don't, 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 if you feel like you're getting roadblocked, like sort of move on to something else, right? Um, because, uh, because yeah, this is definitely, and I mean, like I, I just threw this out here and didn't test this right, so this could very well take me days too, because <laughs> uh, you never know, right? Um, so so yeah, let's not let's like if you feel like it, it's 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 uh, if you feel like it's there's something weird going on, like and you're you're not making progress after like you know 15, 20 minutes, it's the same same thing, weird stuff, like just ping me, get her, and and then I'll 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 see if I can bang my head against it and that way, you know, because we, I don't, you know, let's, let's not, let's not have you um, bang your head against this a million times if it's just going to be, because we don't know if this is going to work, right? Like with, <laughs> this is definitely up in the air. Technically, yeah. I think it should work, but, but obviously I haven't seen this before. So yeah. Well, cool. All right. Well, thanks guys. Um, anything else from anybody? No, that was it. Thank you. All right. Have uh, a good one. Oh, yeah. Anything from you? Yeah, I had to ask one thing. What's the error with the Spacey Gold? Oh, Spacey Gold. Did oh. did I fix that one? Or I believe the error was, I think, because I think I tried to put a patch up. So I believe the error was yep. just the fact that we migrated from the 3.x, the 2.0 API to the 3.0 API. And that happened in between... Um, you know, I think maybe, I think, I think what happened is when you removed the accuracy method, like that happened in between the removal of the accuracy method and the addition of the score. And so when we rebased, we didn't see a conflict because it was in a, the method changed files essentially. And so Git didn't raise a conflict saying that, you know, Hey, we need to go update that file. Um, so, so what ended up happening there is we just needed to, you know, take the, take that change that would have it would have come up if we'd had a rebase uh, or it would have come up if the method had stayed in the same file but since we removed it and then we removed the method and then the rebase resulted in um yeah i don't know you, you know what i'm saying though i'm not exactly sure what happened but i think it's because we removed the method and then also there was a change to the same method to update it but since the method was removed then git doesn't detect the fact that it was changed um so I just had to take those changes and put them into the score. Does that okay. that all sound good? Yep. Cool. But it's still failing. So it's I still failing. To... What? <laughs> oh my god. Oh, okay. Oh no. I'm sorry. 
Oh my gosh. Well, let's see. That was obviously my fault then because I went and tried to change it. Um, I don't think... What the hell happened? I swear I tested it. Um, still mad about no spacey gold? Oh my god. No, this wasn't the one that I didn't. Oh my gosh. This is, I t did I tell you guys? No, I think I forgot to tell you. I deleted my DFML local copy um, this morning which is not my favorite thing to do. Um, no module spacey gold. Where the hell are you getting that from? Or we're not even using spacey gold anymore, are we? In here? Where's it getting uh, that from? We are actually using it, but I think in my... Oh, language. we're importing yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to change the import. Yeah, I forgot to change the import. Okay, I see, I see. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Great. I was like, I was like, I knew. I was like, I swear I'd changed it. So I didn't test it. I didn't test it locally. So I was bad. Sorry. <laughs> I probably. Great. Okay. Yeah. I think we just need to remove that one line um, here. Um, see. Yeah. I probably did this, and then I was like, CI. Um, okay. Great. Sorry about that. Sweet. Well, thanks, guys. Have a good one, and I'll, I'll talk you. to you later. Bye. Bye.